Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, from Alexandria, Virginia, where it's a little hotter than London today. I'm Ricky Ellison. I'm the founder and chairman of the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance. Founded it in 2002, when our nation withdrew from the ABM Treaty when NORTHCOM was founded, and after the 9-11 strike, where our nation moved to get a missile defense capability, both cruise and ballistic, in place. I have just come from Europe uh, last week and I'm very familiar with Europe. My first visit there was in 1983. As an MDA uh, chairman, we have been involved with uh, live fire tests with missile defense in Romania, in Poland, in Crete. We have hosted uh, European Missile Defender of the Year events in Berlin, in The Hague, in Limestein, Germany. We've had a, a phenomenal trip last week. Uh, and having strong discussions on what the challenges are for NATO, for our services, for our partner nations. And there's no question, the biggest gap in capability and capacity is missile defense for NATO, for our services, and for the partner nations. It is still a shock that over 5,000 civilians have died because of missile attack over the last several months. Russia has fired 3,000 missiles in the Ukraine. And the military casualties are much more than that. So we have a real combat situation that's killing lives daily today, yesterday, that we have not resolved and putting a solution in place to defend that, to deter it, or to stop it. We also see Ukraine with the very minimum capabilities of man pads, stingers, and Russian S-300s have enough to keep them in the fight with Russia. That's also a vital ingredient for their survival. So today, it's not about recognizing the gap. The gap is there. And I can go all the way back in March when we had a drone fly from Ukraine, a Russian drone that went through three NATO countries undetected and no fire solutions with that. We are at the top level of both missing a, a joint air domain cross service allied and partner command and control to track missiles and to create firing solutions for missiles. We have sensor, lack of sensor capabilities for overhead horizon. The Russians are using the mountains to disguise your missiles coming in. We have lack of that and we have lack of effectors. We can't rely on Patriot. That is a ballistic missile effector at 120 degrees. So today's discussion is to look at what are the near-term solutions right now to defend civilians and our, our troops forward. And what is the vision? What is the vision for NATO, for our country, in having a solid missile defense architecture that's effective? That, that is what we're discussing today, and we're able to bring you the experts, and we've balanced it from the Navy, from the Air Force, USAFE, from the Army, and from NATO. It's important. Our president has put in the same system that he has in the United States Capitol for cruise missile defense, the NASAM, and he's put that in Kiev. That's a movement, and that's not a program or record for our Army. We got to look at some of the realities here, what has to be done quickly. So I'd like to begin the conversation with Commander John Lips. He has uh, known him quite a while. He is our first inaugural Indo-PACOM 
Missile Defender of the Year for the United States Navy back in 2017. John's the Task Force Commander 64 out in Naviano, Italy, I believe, that's in charge of all the maritime integrated air missile defense capabilities. And he has been exceptional in that role. And the Navy has been exceptional in that role. As you know, our president has upped the ante and given us six Aegis US BMD ships to row to Spain. We've had four there. And in 2003, when we began the movement to defend Europe from ballistic missiles from Iran, the Navy was a core competent leader in that. They have led the charge uh, with supporting their command and control, the BIMDOC and Ramstein, and having a well-run command and control centers and effectors to defeat and defend Europe from our mind. So I'm going to pass this over to my good friend, Commander John Lips. It's all yours, John. Hey, Ricky, uh, thank you very much. And ciao from Naples, Italy uh, here. Uh, it is a great opportunity to, to sit down and have this conversation with you and the other leaders uh, of the integrated air and missile defense community. So I, I sincerely appreciate that. You know, a, a few points that I think are important to, to highlight um, is as we look at time now, you spoke about ongoing operations in the eastern flank, uh, and that is absolutely um, you know, a, a astute observation of an employment of these uh, threat systems uh, that is occurring right now. It is relevant and it is happening. At the same time, you know, I would also uh, submit that as we look at uh, the leadership changes within the theater, it is the summer, summer permanent change of station season, and we are not missing a beat across the alliance, you know, under the leadership of the USAFE Aircom team, the 10th AAMDC, uh, and the, the JFCs that the components support, quite frankly. And so I think that's an important, as we look at, you know, the capabilities that we subscribe to in the future, recognizing uh, that in order to get there, first we have to have a weather eye on the situation. And I would offer that that is being provided uh, in Ramstein on a daily basis, quite frankly. Uh, and so I, you know, I ex express a great uh, appreciation uh, to the team as we look at the IAMD fight because it affects all components. Uh, when I look at it, I, you know, when I talk about air and missile defense uh, in the Maritime Operations Center or with Navy leadership, it is a mission that we have to conduct from the ocean bottom all the way up to low Earth orbit. Uh, and we have to be successful uh, because as I look at the maneuver force uh, in the maritime domain, if I am not successfully able to conduct um, the totality of the missions that I am tasked with, uh, be it force protection or defense, I can't support uh, that integrated air and missile defense architecture uh, that is needed across the alliance. And so, you know, just a, a couple of examples, I think, where we are going forward here in theater quickly. Um, you know, last month, I was embarked as a surface action group commander on an HMS Defender. Um, and so she's one of the UK Type 45s. They're high-end air warfare platforms that use the Samson radar and their Sea Viper missile system. Um, and it was a fantastic uh, integration of both NATO Alliance partners but also uh, we had in my task group, uh, Swedish and um, Finnish uh, Navy assets as well. And so when we looked at the, the generation of effects in the Baltic, um, it was a great opportunity uh, to stitch together this holistic picture that's required for the execution of the mission. Um, we're building towards next May, the formidable Shield 23, and you talked, you know, Early on, the nascent formidable Shield 15 was a single SM3 launch on the Hebrides range against a ballistic missile target. Um, formidable Shield 23 will include F-35s, GBAD, NASAMs, Patriot, ships from 11 different countries. Um, and we are going to be conducting all domain operations to include engagements of anti-ship cruise missile targets 
with fighter aircraft. Um, and, and I don't even like to consider that an exercise. I, I use the parlance that it's a mission rehearsal for a live fire um, uh, campaign, quite frankly. And so it spans all the domains, it spans all the components, uh, and it's a good example of being able to pull together this high-end combat capability that is necessary in light of real-world activity. Um, it is a reflection of what the Alliance does with the leadership that's in theater. And finally, you know, the, the other piece that I was mentioning um, to the team today is, you know, I grew up in a world where I thought of integrated air and missile defense constrained by my organic radar or my organic effector. And that is no longer the world that we live in today. Um, you know, just as integral to being able to close the fire control uh, solution across the joint force is the sensors, the effectors, but it is that architecture that is able to bring us together and uh, provide an uninterrupted track. Um, you know, we are all constrained from either geography, curvature of the earth, topography, weather, it affects us all. And so uh, we have to take that into account and leverage the totality of capability across the joint force in order to bring together the holistic solution. And I think I'll pause there. Thanks, John. Your command and control is so done so well with Aegis that you do have fire control that spreads across different effectors and sensors in different domains. That applicability to Ramstein, to the BIM dock, to the other services, can you, how do we get there? on non-Navy systems to be able to have that type of fire control network and can the BIMDOC, that's a ballistic missile defense command and control, also take on the integrated air missile defense, cruise missiles, et cetera, underneath that, or is that blatantly not able to do that? Um, I suspect, you know, this will probably be uh, projecting into someone else's wheelhouse, but from a, the BIMDOC, as that matures, um, what we will all recognize collectively is what we've always known, that there is uh, no separation when we're talking about integrated air and missile defense. It's an integrated fight. Uh, and so, you know, when you walk into the Air Operations Center um, or the, the AIRCOM Operations Center and you look at the integration of those fights, that migration is happening. We're moving in that direction, Ricky. And I'm heartened by that. Uh, it's just that we, you know, um, we are constrained by legacy acquisition processes uh, across the services and components uh, that is being addressed, I think, within the department, um, both from a, um, a endorsement of the JADC2 construct as it moves forward and matures, but then also demand signals for capabilities that are outside of the UCOM AOR when I think of either Defense of Guam or NORTHCOM's requirements as they are articulated in public hearings. So, you know, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, it's just the accelerant by which to get there as quickly as we need. Thanks, John. You know, that, that BLS and that, that those common systems that you have, it's just phenomenal on near-term capabilities to present both strike and defensive in a wide variety of ranges, and that's what you're seeing in Guam. But I, I want to move on to who's in charge of the command and control in Europe, which is our United States Air Force Europe, USAPI. We have Brig Brigadier General Jason Hines with us, Big B, on that. And, and he and that, that group understands how important it is to defend their maneuvering forces, which are their air forces and their air bases throughout Europe to be able to create that deterrent and projection of force if needed, but they don't have the capacity to defend those bases. And they know it's the Army's mission and the Army doesn't have the capacity to defend those bases. So it's a, the Air Force has to look at it and has been looking at it on how to solve this problem. So I think I want to introduce uh, Big B. We had some great discussions last week at Ramstein and want to open that uh, dialogue up to you, Big B, it's your, all yours. Hey, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. 
Uh, you're right, we, we have capacity challenges uh, internal to the United States Air Forces in Europe, and a lot of that's due to just the changing uh, theater structure from the 1990s to today. Uh, like you said, we don't really need to talk much about the threat. The threat's changed uh, over the last 10 years, and just some things that we've seen recently, like you highlighted, were interesting capabilities that Russia's developing, things like the Skyfall nuclear cruise missile, that's unique. That was a different one. Some of the hypersonic cruise missiles they're using against uh, against uh, Ukraine, like you highlighted, those are uh, unique challenges as well. So we've got to make the best of the capacity we have now. And the capacity we've got, uh, finally, fifth-gen fighters. We've got fourth-gen fighters that are getting modified as well with, with capabilities that are going to help us do the cruise missile defense mission. And I see opportunities there uh, quite a bit and make sure that, one, we can integrate with our Army teammates, but more importantly, we integrate with our allies and partners. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll scratch the itch on that as well, because that's pretty important to us at, Air, at, at USAFE, along with our partners next door at, at, uh, at AIRCOM. Some of our partners and allies have huge capabilities or even capacity, readiness, sometimes concept of operations that, that they've been working on for a long time. Someone else brought up Sweden. Uh, they're one of our closest partners as well, and they've, they've learned how to maneuver in the face of a threat uh, that might be projecting power against them while they have to survive and generate combat power. So we're learning a lot from them. We're sharing a lot of our ideas with them from, you know, the planning level all the way down to the, you know, the youngest operator, whether it's on an F-35 from us or it might be an F-16. Uh, and, and they've been really helpful into making sure that we, collective we, from the NATO powers to us, we have the readiness that we need, at least the highest level of readiness we can uh, in, the, in the event that crisis turns into conflict. Right? We don't want that to happen, so we want to have the deterrence capabilities that we need. That's not easy, and it takes, it takes a lot of sharing. Uh, someone brought up connectivity. I focus on air domain awareness and making sure that we have a common understanding of the operational environment from the operational level, the operational C2 level that we do at the Air Operations Center, all the way down to the to the pilot in the in the cockpit, uh, trying to work joint engagement operations with the 10th double AMDC while they're operating a Patriot over one of our uh, our main operating bases or forward on the eastern flank like we're doing in a couple of our a couple of nations right now. That's hard and it takes practice, right? It takes an understanding of the threat, it takes an understanding of everybody else's capabilities, and then it, it takes the connective tissue. Sometimes we have that connective tissue, and sometimes our practicing exposes gaps in our connective tissue between us and some of our joint force and, and really some of our closest partners and allies. One of the other opportunities we see is with Sweden and Finland joining NATO, as that starts to progress forward, we're looking for opportunities to ensure that we can share uh, and uh, it's a shared data, right? And it's not the collective data about who owns my data. It's about what value and benefit do you see in sharing the data so we can see fused information that gives us, I'd say, a, a better, um, a more accurate picture of the air domain. And that's something we all need real time. And it's playing out for us front and center uh, with Russia and what they're doing against Ukraine. Uh, and we're learning exactly what that layered approach needs to look like in the future. For, for, for us in USAFE, one of the things that we're doing pretty hard is we're, we're trying to make sure that we have the right layered approach. Uh, Mr. Ellison, you and I chatted about this in one of the in our in our in our building in the building last week, and I appreciate the discussion. We need the right sensors. We already have some. We don't have enough. We need the right connectivity. Uh, we brought up JADC2 earlier, but the connectivity that we're establishing today. In NBC has been such a great partner with us. Uh, just to make sure that we have the right connectivity at our level, at the operational C2 level, versus just a theater-wide operational C2 structure that we have to integrate the land and air power. Uh, that's that's a tall ask. NATO comes into this as well. We're really close to our AIRCOM team. They, they literally work 300 feet from us in their headquarters, but sometimes that's the longest 300 feet in the entire European theater. Uh, just connecting our two headquarters, we've made significant strides over the last two and a half years, uh, but that's at the headquarter level. And you'll I bet you Mr. Goffis will probably end up chatting about the connective, uh, the connectivity challenges that we have across all of the NATO partners. But we take that opportunity with Sweden and Finland joining NATO in the future as something that allows us to start to, to, to weave them in uh, into Norway and into the greater NATO uh, air picture so we can start to, to, to ensure that the operators in the front have that right, that right air picture that they're going to need. And that we'll have it for the joint force as well if we have to do some type of unilateral action to defend ourselves. That layered approach, you've got to exercise it, right? And that can't just be in a small scale location defending one base. It's got to be integrated across the theater, a theater-wide exercise, all based on the threat. The threat's not going to come at us from one direction anymore. 
everybody knows it's a 360 degree threat, which means all the partners that are in NATO, all the partners that are here in the European theater, they've got to see themselves in this theater wide um, operational C2 structure because it's going to benefit them just as much as it will benefit the United States Air Forces in Europe and it will benefit the, the joint force. So as we start to develop the exercise approach that we need to help us get after the theater wide operational C2 structures, we've got to make sure from the USAFE side that we've got the right capabilities, whether it's from operational C2 or it's weapons on airplanes or it's the, the sensors on the airplanes to make sure that we're able to uh, defend the skies of Europe uh, and, and we're, we're practicing it before we have to ever have to do it in combat. But in the end, each one of our airplanes, as we're starting to look at capability gaps, we've got to make sure that they can one, project power, but they can also do cruise missile defense today and, and, and against tomorrow's threats, whether that's in 2030 or in 2025. Uh, that's not a tall ask, but it's something that we just have to acknowledge that, uh, that, that the jets have to have that capability and, and, their, and our airplanes have to, or sorry, our personnel have to have the right training to be able to conduct that mission. It's a hard mission to do. Cruise missile defense is not easy. Uh, and you have, to get, you have to be trained to it. And so do our partners, just like the operational C2 part. We got to exercise that as well. So as we start to build out the future capabilities in the theater, uh, one, we'll, we'll keep cruise missile defense in the front of our minds. Uh, and But we also have to recognize that every airplane that we have doing cruise missile defense, it's one airplane less that the JFAC has available to do, whether it's offensive operations or to move the airplanes to where there might be a capability gap across the NATO theater as well. So there's a lot there, a lot for us to discover. We could spend an hour talking about all this kind of stuff, just each individually from the air component perspective. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity just to chat. So, sir, back over to you. Um, we noticed that most of the European powers have their missile defense capabilities in their airports. And their, their ability to defend their own maneuvering force is inherent in that aspect of it. We know the limitations of our army. We got Patriots all over, very thin. What is the near term, from your perspective, of getting cruise missile defense capabilities on your air base with forward or back, or are we going to continue to disperse from this and take the hit? Where are we going? Because the future stuff is not coming in four or five years minimum to get something in here. I just want to put that out to, 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 to create a greater deterrent for all your NATO air forces as well, and trade space between having offense and defense, that needs to be discussed as well. Just sure. Absolutely. Right. So first and foremost, there's three things we're looking at right now to help us build out the defensive capabilities for the theater, for at least for our, our main operating bases. And that's the sense, make sense, and then act mentality. The sense is we've got to have active and passive sensors to be able to detect any type of cruise missile that might be approaching one of our bases. And that detection is going to come from a layered approach. It might be you know, 300 miles east of Ramstein, it could be uh, somewhere in, in Poland where we have to have our first indication, our first ability to sense the cruise missile entering the theater. Because that may be where our first opportunity to see it so we can start to take action. So the sense part is a layered approach that we're gonna have to have from things like E3, maybe E7 in the future, to, to sensors along the way that are owned by, that are built and owned by our partner nations. And as long as they're able to, con we're able to connect that uh, into the upper overall operational C2 structure, that'll increase our own uh, our, our own situational awareness for our main operating bases. The make sense is the hard part because we want to be able to have our wing commanders at each one of our main operating bases have the same domain awareness that the JFAC does, and in, in, you know, sitting here at the AOC at Ramstein. So we got to be able to make sure that we can distribute that, so distributed command and control down to the lowest appropriate level. And then the act part is where you're getting at, right? That's hard. That's in the near term, we know we're not going to get any major changes to capabilities that we, we know we need to have. So we're going to have to be able to live with what the Army has available to us in phase zero or in phase one. And then if the capacity just isn't there, then we're going to have to get after uh, cheaper things that allow us to have increase our survivability as well, uh, which I really can't get into much on the on methods that we're doing that. But I'll tell you, we are taking action on that and spending significant dollars on uh, giving our base commanders the ability to defend themselves uh, in, in different manners, and then also to be able to disperse their forces, right? So we've, we've developed the Agile Combat Employment concept of operations. That's going to allow our, our wing commanders to generate combat power in the face of an attack. Uh, and we're learning a lot from some of our partners up in the north that have done that pretty well. In the long term, we're trying to build out the, 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 the budget, if you will, in the Air Force to make sure that we do have the right capabilities in the future to be able to have an active role in defense. Because just like you said, the Joint Force isn't going to have the 
Um, we don't expect to have the capabilities that we need to be able to defend each one of our main operating bases. So maybe just that one real quick point, that, that incident of that drone going through three NATO countries. Are we going, how we're doing basically with Trust Cloud, where open information gets put on a cloud and people can draw it to leverage it like we're doing very effectively in Ukraine. Are we able to move with missile defense in that cloud or is that cloud got not to be trusted, it's got to be private with fire control to do something like that? And how do we prevent what that Russian um, airspace intrusion happen? I, th I think you can go to a cloud-based architecture for domain awareness. But like you said, when it comes to the operational command and control or even down to the tactical level of command and control, that might be an area where you try to segregate it, to federate it, so you can ensure in case the cloud does get cut off for whatever reason, that the installation commander, the wing commander that's trying to defend their main operating base, they don't rely, they won't have to rely on an operational C2 structure that is back at a main operating base or reliant upon a, you know, a mm -hmm. domain server that could get cut fairly quickly. We want them to have the, the domain awareness that's being shared, uh, just like our NATO partners want it. But then they want to have the ability to act on their own should that cord get cut. So I think it might be more than one layer. I think there'll be a, a couple of different layers of data clouds, uh, one that's available to the base commanders, and then one that would be, that would be more theater wide. Okay, thank you. We, uh, we now have the Army perspective. Uh, I had, we had great discussions with the U.S. Army over there last week, the change of command for the 10th happened with Mo Barrett. And now uh, we do have Dave Shank, the former 10th WABC commander with us to give a little light on uh, the Army's situation in Europe, which is very limited with one battalion, four batteries of Patriots and a tremendous mission <laughs> set to do. So Dave, it's, it's on you. Hey, thanks Ricky. And uh, thanks to the MDAA team for uh, allowing me to participate. And as always, it's a pleasure and uh, it's great to be on board uh, in this virtual setting uh, with an all-star cast, that's for sure. Um, hey, I just want to cover really just three areas. Um, and uh, both John, John Lips uh, mentioned it, uh, uh, Bigby mentioned it there, um, and you even touched on it as well. Uh, but, but the bottom line is just from, from a ground perspective, uh, from an American ground perspective, uh, we're just lacking the capability and the capacity to uh, uh, to do uh, to provide the integrated air missile defense. Again, from a ground perspective. Um, now, I'll talk uh, just really three areas real quick. Um, from an Army Air Missile Defense Command, um, as you just described, currently in Europe, the 10th Double AMDC, um, it's it's just a lack of uh, capability and capacity on the ground. Um, again, that's on ground in Europe. I'll come back to that point. You mentioned the Patriot, well, you got a brigade headquarters. You mentioned that one Patriot battalion, you have one short range air defense battalion um, who is in the process of transitioning to the uh, maneuver shore ad, the striker based platform. Um, you've had, you have some separate battery capability. And then of course you've got some, uh, uh, some additional attachments that are there supporting the uh, deployed forces uh, forward along the Eastern flank. Um, all that said, you've got some sensor capability and, and let's not forget, and I'm an advocate of, of this and, and some may disagree, but uh, uh, counter UAS is an integrated air missile defense to me. Um, they're part of the process. They use some of the same sensor capabilities, uh, the same feeds, uh, passing some of the same track data uh, in order to conduct a successful engagement of a, of a unmanned platform. Um, and so, so that's 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 number one. Uh, you know, what is the double NDC? What do they look like? Well, they don't look like a whole lot in Europe right now. Uh, secondly, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, the responsibilities. And, and as as a double as a former double NDC commander, um, you know, the double NDC cam commander is, is the driver of all things integrated air missile defense for, for the ground forces. Oh, by the way, uh, he or she is all, uh, also. Uh, serves as the Deputy Area Air Defense Commander uh, to the CFAC, so uh, which uh, in this case the UCAP Gap Africa Commander. Um, in addition to that, they wear two other hats, the Theater Army Air Missile Defense Coordinator, and, and that's their role as they support the ground force, specifically U.S. Army Europe. Um, and then lastly, uh, and, and very closely related to that, that support to the U.S. Army Europe Commander and, and that team, 
they're also serving as the senior American Air Defense Artillery Officer in the theater. So uh, a great responsibility, uh, a must to leverage uh, your staff uh, and your leadership across the DC because you can only be in one place at one time. Um, but again, the support there, and I, I tried to tie that into where do they fit in that joint picture. So as you think, uh, whether it's a Deputy Air Air Defense Commander, Theater Army Air and Missile Defense Coordinator, uh, there are those relationships, ongoing and continuous relationships with, with the joint community. So you see APF Africa, uh, NAVUR, so uh, John Lips and the team down in uh, Naples, uh, as well as uh, the Marine Forces in Europe. So. Uh, um, so again, driver of all things air missile, integrated air missile defense. Last point is uh, how do the allies and partners fit into this picture? So uh, uh, extremely uh, critical uh, to, to have those relationships. Um, and and this, this is a continuous process. So whether it's through some type of developed engagement strategy um, where you identify uh, countries that possess certain capabilities, uh, that 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 maybe the opinion is that they're they're a little more in and all in uh, ready ready to participate and support uh, versus other countries that maybe aren't meeting the two percent spending uh, with regards to a country's GDP um, that that might be just sitting back on the sidelines so to speak and, and not willing to participate as much. So um, you you want to build again those relationships through that engagement and strategy through that engagement strategy. Uh, and prioritize, you know, those uh, those relationships um, because it, in the end, it's 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 the integration piece. Again, this has already been discussed. You know, how are you integrated? Not just at the joint, uh, but at the multinational level. It's the interoperability piece. Big B hit on that uh, already. No need to uh, talk about it. Uh, he talked about uh, you know the layer, the three three hundred sixty degree uh, ability. Uh, he talked about common air picture. Uh, a great point about the cloud uh, and what you can pull from the cloud uh, and, and making sense of, of everything ongoing. Um, and then my last point, Ricky, if I may, is uh, I mean, you touched on a little bit is, and we talked the other day about it. It's just, so, you know, you have these legacy systems uh, currently on hand. Um, and then, of course, you've got the way ahead. So the Army Integrated Air Missile Defense Program and everything that falls within that program. Uh, right now, that's not going to show up overnight. We all know that. So how do you how do you continue to uh, fight uh, and win with uh, legacy legacy systems as you continue to transition towards towards the future? So uh, it, it is a transitional process, uh, that's for sure. Um, and I, I'm, I'll tell you what, I'll stop right there, Ricky. I know you're going to ask some questions, and we're going to do some Q and A at the end. Thanks, Dave. I, I want to go back. And Bigby brought it up too, how important exercising this is. Not tabletops, not what we've been doing for the last 15 years as the 10th AAMDC is doing partial exercises with partial countries in different areas and firing one missile. That's not going to work anymore. And I know NATO has not has been resistant to doing an all-out, fully integrated missile defense exercise across NATO. And this would, for me, not only on sterile nights, but it would include formidable shield, the whole thing together. I, I mean, it seems like that's got to be done today. It's acceptable to doing that today. We have to do that today. And I want to know where we're at with that. Are we shifting into, into demanding that to happen? I think John touched uh, a little bit about, he mentioned uh, formidable shield and, and some of the things going up, uh, ongoing uh, life fire exercises up in the Hebrides uh, in Northern Scotland. Um, uh, but uh, no disagreement here. Um, you know, the days of, uh, and Bigby mentioned it, the days of uh, slow pitch softball are long gone. And, and President Trump demonstrated that uh, with that tea lamp strike uh, uh, on Aleppo a few years ago. Um, and that's what we need to be prepared for 58 tea lamps coming at one location, uh, how do you defend against that? And so uh, it is through it is through uh, multi uh, joint and combined exercises. It is through massive joint and combined live fire exercises uh, over over a a um, a uh, large battle space. And and, and uh, I I think you just hit on something too is you know how how does uh, 
how do you how do you look at potentially a uh, I dare I use the term a two front uh, exercise, but you know how do you conduct an, a a a joint and combined exercise, say somewhere in the med, uh, while you're also conducting a joint and combined exercise somewhere in the Baltic Sea, um, and so we know there's a number of uh, Hollywood names out there that that, that relate to some, what I just described. Um, is is that possible? But but even more so, and with the current ongoing fight, which in Big B talked about, John Lips talked about, Aircom is who, who who's managing this, and so uh, Aircom right now has their hands full uh, for for all the right reasons. But uh, what a great opportunity! Um, and I, I failed at this. I was never able to really pull in Aircom and and, and have that have that node participate uh, in, in, a, in an overarching exercise. Um, but but how does how do you take uh, a C2 node like Aircom at that level uh, and, and they truly manage what's ongoing? Well, I think that's where I, you know, we're in a perfect situation where someone like Chris Caboli can move this and move it not just with defense, but we have to play with the offense as well. And I think the political environment, everything's set for doing something like this. We have to do it. So we lead right into Tom. Who, who is the uh, Assistant Secretary for NATO for all operations, just a phenomenal advocate. Uh, he was the policy director for the Senate Armed Service Committee. And really, Tom, you, you helped move uh, where we are with Guam. I appreciate that. And your experience is, is renowned. Um, and this is a big problem that I think you, you are grappling at that level that you are with the Secretary. For sure. We haven't got to mute. That's that's what happens when you leave me alone with technology, I guess. Um, thanks, Ricky. Um, yeah, so let me just start with a story. As a recovering fighter pilot, um, I was serving hard time at STRATCOM as a battle watch commander. And uh, General Cartwright uh, set up an exercise ahead of a potential North Korean missile launch. And um, we didn't know whether the missile was, it was gonna be uh, a satellite launch or whether it's gonna be a, an attack on some kind of US uh, uh, facility in the Indo-Pacific. And of course the window, uh, as, as the uh, missile defense world knows, uh, for making that determination and taking action is very, very small. So General Cartwright smartly said, we're gonna exercise this. And uh, Secretary Rumsfeld said, I'm gonna play in this. And uh, so I'm sitting down on the battle watch commander floor. The exercise kicks off and General Cartwright's there. And he says, you know, call the secretary. So you call the secretary up, you get his aid. And, you know, it's like nine o'clock at night uh, in Omaha. And uh, the military aide goes, um, he just went to bed. You want me to wake him up? And I look at, at General Cartwright who's sitting next to me and he goes, yeah. And he's got a little smile on his face. Um, and I'm like, okay, yes, please wake up the secretary. So they wake him up, you know, Russell, 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 get to the secure comms. They do all that stuff. Finally, they get him on the phone. And I hand it over to the missile defense guru on the watch floor. And he's reading the script and he goes, Mr. Secretary, you have 31 seconds to decide whether to shoot down this, uh, this missile. And of course, Secretary Rumsfeld is known for his ability to uh, weave a tapestry of four letter words, oh. and um, which he, he then subsequently did. And uh, I, I'll do the mild version, which is uh, um, and General Cartwright went by Haas. He goes, Haas, what the hell is going on here? Stop this freaking exercise right now. And of course, you know, the four letter words are flying. There's only 150 or 200 people on the call. And he, you know, proceeds to try and chew him out. And meanwhile, I'm looking at, uh, at General Cartwright. He's got a little smile on his face. And he just, you know, is explaining the physics of the thing to the political level. And um, the problem at the time was uh, that weapons release authority at that point in time was held at the secretary of defense level. Um, because if you take this thing out and make the wrong decision, you just created obviously an international incident and who knows what's going to uh, come from that. So um, by the end of this thing, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld said, Haas, you have weapons release authority delegated right there on the spot. And um, that's how we got to sanity. 
And what I think it tried to show was how difficult the political interface is with integrated air and missile defense, and also how important it is to have political interface, to exercise the political interface with integrated air and missile defense. So um, that's kind of you know where I start with this. And when you you all think of ops, you're thinking of J3s and, and moving pucks around and moving people around and soldiers. I'm more uh, ops policy, quite frankly. And in the fun world of NATO headquarters, I actually don't own integrated air and missile defense or any part of it at this point in time. It's owned by what the DOD equivalent would be, would be uh, acquisition and sustainment. And it's because of how thing grew up and there's a lot of, there's too many stories to tell you about how that happened, but that's where it sits. So I'll try and give you a little bit of my perspective and how we're approaching it from a strategic uh, level on how to do this. Uh, one, just like Ricky said, um, lessons learned from Ukraine. That's where we start. Uh, thousands of missiles, a large percentage of those missiles in the first few days. And um, I think the the TLAM, you know, the 57 TLAMs is exactly what I'm talking about. And um, and I'm stealing this from uh, one of the NATO generals in the, in the international military staff. What we learned is, or what we should have learned, is that this is a day zero risk for NATO. We're not going to have a whole bunch of INW that says, get ready, get set, go. We've got to be able to handle this right up front. Um, and, uh, you know, the Russian reliance on ballistic and cruise missiles. Um, and, you know, as Big B said, uh, they appear to be testing at least their hypersonic capabilities and sending messages with those. Um, so to us, to every, every single person I know on this uh, video right now, the need for integrated air missile defense appears self-evident. So it's a bit of a paradox that at the political level, um, here at NATO headquarters and uh, beyond to capitals, to a lot of capitals, integrated air and missile defense is not more of a top priority in Europe. And so I tried to figure out like, why the hell is that true? And, and honestly, in my job, I live right at that intersection of uh, politics and military. And, and so, you know, off the record, there are a lot of ambassadors that want to be generals and admirals and a lot of generals and admirals that want to be ambassadors. So I do a lot of explaining between those two levels. Um, and so why is this so damn hard for NATO to get its hands around? I think, number one, it's political. Number two, it's expensive. And number three, it's hard. And I'll talk a little bit about each one of those very quickly. Um, and, and I know that Cobra, if he were here, would be telling you, like, getting a critical, a critical asset list is really hard. What, is, what needs to be protected? And it's inherently political. Um, if you look at it with a political lens versus, versus a military lens, then you've got to make a call on what's more important, a population center? Is Paris more important than a port, than, uh, say, a power plant? Uh, or, a, or a critical water dam, um, it, it's really hard to do that. It's hard to do that within a nation, let alone go, yeah, now I'm going to lend my toys to NATO so they can defend what they think is important. So it's inherently a political decision, and that's part of what makes it so hard. Um, the second piece is, and this is really where we're at. Um, Ricky, you know, and, and I don't disagree with you, that we have a requirement. Um, but here at the political level, if you admit you have a requirement, um, then you are negligent if you don't fill it. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg self requirement, and that gets expensive really fast, as you know. The two uh, NASAM batteries that are going, that's, that's like a billion dollars worth of a commitment. Um, and that doesn't even include the extra AMRAMs and the supporting sensors and the CTU that go with it. So, you know, if you don't want to be on the hook, for a big, you know, bill at the end of the day, then you might simply deny there's an issue. And a little bit of that is going on, I think, for sure. And finally, um, as you all know, this is really, really hard. And I'm trying to explain why it's really hard, you know, at the political level um, so that they don't take it for granted. And I don't mean um, the physics problem of shooting a bullet with a bullet. I, I get that, but we seem we have technical solutions for that at this point. Maybe way back in the day when Ricky was was in college and and listening to uh, you know the big speech from uh, Ronald Reagan, 
it, it was a lot of a technical issue. Um, it was, was this technically possible? Now that's pretty much settled in terms of we have the ability to do that. So um, why is it hard here at NATO? Number one, it goes across all five domains. And so getting things that go across all domains is really hard. And I know that um, Haji Jalusada is working on multi-domain problems at SACT. Um, it also requires a compromise, as I discussed, between national and NATO. What assets do you, do you transfer to NATO authority and which ones do you keep under national control? What can you afford to give away is one of the questions. Um, and potentially uncover one of your national priorities. Uh, and, and like I said, when you look at it from a political lens, from somebody that needs to get elected, how can they put that out there on the street? That's a really tough thing for them to do. So they're going to have to do, have some courage to do that. And then, Ricky, you hit on this. Almost every single nation has a different flavor of who's responsible for what. You have the U.S. where you have ships and ground and air. Many of the nations just have air. Some nations don't even have an air force. So trying to blend those things gets difficult as well. Here um, at NATO uh, headquarters, we have a different division in charge of uh, emerging, they call them um, uh, emerging disruptive technologies, EDTs, big data and AI, which are gonna be critical for this. So you cross all kinds of organizational lines when you do that. Um, and I think that makes it difficult for all those different reasons. Um, so that said, the first step is convincing at the political level and then the really hard part even if you do that, you know, over a beer, over a whiskey, they'll say, yeah, we got a problem. Um, but then getting them to say out loud collectively, like, you know, we've got a strategic vulnerability here. That hasn't been done. And if it is done, it's immediate, like, and we have a plan for that. Um, but it, it hasn't fixed it to date. I think this is a really big issue to get there. And so you talked about large exercises. I got to tell you, Ricky, and, and and I know sometime, um, you know, over a, a, a very cold martini, you're going to give me a hard time for this. Here's what I want to do. This is my idea. Um, and, I, and I'm proposing it here uh, for the first time uh, in other than, um, you know, at a bar kind of thing over at Bar Napkin. One of the things that I'd like to do to get us going from the bottom up, what you're saying is important from the top down if we can do it. And I know we can do it. It's a matter of having the will. But is to start with... Um, let's pick a level of ambition just out of thin air. It could be more, it could be less. One battery, one week every two months is going to deploy forward, set up in a remote location, and it's going to connect, integrate, and then exercise with actual air assets against those air assets, airplanes, whatever we can get out there, um, you know, drones, and then pack back up and go home. And the reason why I bring this up is NATO knows how to do this. And if you use the channels that NATO already knows, then they're, they're better. Air policing. For example, some of our air policing missions aren't 24-7, 365. There are a couple weeks, every couple of months, deploy, do the act, show you can do it, come back. It makes the, the Russians think twice because they go, oh, hell, they can do it from there too. Um, and it also will work the major muscles that eventually you're going to need for that larger exercise. Can we really integrate a battery? And I don't really care where they go. SAC Ewer can determine what locations they go to and when they go to help with his vigilance activities. So that's just an idea. But I think if we can introduce it and get the ball rolling where people go, oh, this is hard. We need to do it more. We have to do it at a level of ambition that, that nations, if, if I try to do it, you know, every other week for a year, um, they'd lose their minds because it's expensive and they wouldn't want to move their stuff. But if we do something very mild and whether it's, you know, one week every other month or it's once every quarter to start with, once we build it, they will come, I'm convinced. And that's how you integrate domains. So you, you, you're deploying the, the uh, uh, global or the, uh, the ground-based air and missile defense assets, but you're integrating with the air assets, the air policing mission, or you're integrating with naval assets um, when they're in the Med or in the Baltic. And so it's a way of, of but if you, if you can't move the thing in the first place, then you're going to have those other issues. And it's a way of, of doing this routinely and getting those muscles built. So way more than you needed. I apologize. No, that was um, great. Got me all great. fired up. Great. And I think I'd like to have my panel members give a little criticism or, or support for your concept there on moving that one fight. But I, I want to take it back to the command and control. That seems where NATO owns it. That That's the ACT, I think it's called, the AF. The, the overall command and control, you got to have that right. And 
and that doesn't need to be moved anywhere. There is a problem with that. Can you talk to that? And, and, and if there's such a problem with connecting everybody, are we going to let the U.S. lead on this with their JDs, with what they're doing and the cloud? How do we resolve that? That seems to be like number one on, on getting everything else right. We don't have that right. It doesn't matter what the effectors and sensors are. We can't connect. So can you give us a little overview on NATO's command and control? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it, but I won't go too far because, again, it belongs to Camille Grand, uh, who's the ASG for defense investment. Um, and, you know, it's probably not a coincidence you had, that that uh, the French company with the American company were trying to build that thing. And honestly, I think there's recognition here across the board that it's not up to it. And so I think we're at the very nascent stages of what could the next thing look like? And is it a build on or around that? I mean, the basic decisions need to be, is it a build on or around that? Do we need to blank sheet it? Or do we need to tuck in to the, to the slipstream of what the US is doing and plug in there? And uh, I know Bigby knows this and others. Um, it's the, the number of different interfaces is insane to get all the data put together. Um, and it becomes even more insane, even if we get the data right, let the you know, data formats and we have the data lake that everybody can go in and pull the right things out and do the algorithms, uh, the security levels are all over the map. And we need a box. Um, and I know there's technology out there, but we need a box that says, oh, this is Finland. Here's what they're clear to. This is um, France. Here's what they're clear to. Here's the UK and figure out that game. It's, it's not that new um, uh, of a problem, but it is one of the primary ones. So you're putting, uh, Ricky, conceptually, you're putting the exact right thing on the table. I think that needs to be a part of using what happened in Ukraine to wake up the folks here at the political level. And that's gonna be a piece of it, which is how do you do that? And, and I did try to tap Cobra before he left to try and get as we talked about before, a checklist of how do we approach this? How do you eat the elephant? Because it's an elephant. And what what you really get a lot of is you kind of get a, a bit of the academic world where you go, okay, let's look at the problem from this side, turn it around, look at it that side, and look at it this side. And everybody acknowledges there are a lot of problems, but we need the checklist of what are the big rocks? What are the big lines of effort? in order to make this go, and then assign the cross-functional teams, because almost every single one is going to be cross-functional to get at those problems. And I would say, you know, the first part is to start with an inventory, and I know, I think UCOM's already doing some of this, and Big Beat can probably comment on that, of what are the sensors out there? What's, what's out there? What's not even connected? Um, and the algorithms we have today can take two crappy sensors, put them together, and actually get a decent picture out of it. Um, but it's a lot more than two sensors, obviously. So I don't have the answer to your questions. Um, that is the right but question, though. But you're pushing. I mean, this is what's got to be done. The discussion's got to be done at this level. And yep. and we got to leverage what we're doing with the cloud, what we're doing in Ukraine to be able to do the command and control. And that's the that's the answer. Because once you got that, then you can build everything else underneath. Hell yeah. Okay, well, hey, you're great. We're running a little over time, but we're going to stay with whoever can stay would be great. I want to have Mark uh, come in, my fellow board member, um, an expert <laughs> on a lot of things. Certainly, uh, Europe is one of them. Mark, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Ricky. Um, so we do have we do have some questions from outside. I'm gonna, I'm going to read a couple of them, but in the meantime, um, I do want to follow up a little bit on on. Um, Tom's point, I think he's exactly right. The, the challenge is that while the need for the cruise missile defense, air, you know, integrated air missile defense systems is evident, the investment is not evident. And uh, and he's right, it's across political expense and, and, um, and the fact that it is a challenging thing. But I would say this, we need to remind ourselves, there's not, there's a lot out there. Uh, Tom and his team have done a good job over the last few years and, you know, we have, five NATO countries with NASAMs or four NATO countries, Spain, um, Norway, uh, Lithuania, and the Netherlands. And then of course, Finland joining has NASAMs. Um, the uh, Brits have Skysaber, the French and Italians have SAMT. 
Uh, I mean, everyone but the United States has something to bring to this uh, dance. And it, those are words that you almost never hear inside NATO. Um, the, uh, it's certainly not on a principal war fighting need. So the United States does need to get working there. But I like the idea of the exercise. I'm not sure I'd even have to put, not every one of them would have to be a road game. I would actually just exercise bringing those seven countries and their systems, you know, one a month through Ramstein. Make them integrate with the Patriot systems. Make them communicate back and forth to the uh, air, the AOC, to the uh, the air battle manager, and, and you know, and the ADC, and make sure that we that each one of them can seamlessly move in and out uh, of the systems. To me, a that would keep the cost down a little bit, you know, since they would be hosted almost immediately, and and not that NATO is always about cost, but it's sometimes about cost, and uh, and and it's, since someone's a contributor here here. But we need to get people used to the idea that someone's going to need to defend Ramstein uh, alongside our patriots, and it's for the foreseeable future, it's an ally. Uh, the other one I, I would I would suggest on this is we probably want to find one of our uh, one of these beautiful warehouses we've built with 14 billion dollars worth of U.S. Um, armored uh, tracked armored uh, and uh, uh, wheeled and tracked vehicles. Um, you know, with the European De Deterrence Initiative money, they're spread from. Uh, Poland to Belgium, you know, including the G Germany and the Netherlands and even Luxembourg a little bit. Uh, we need to defend these things. So having one of these systems go there and just see what the uh, the problem is. You know, some of these warehouses are near a lot of other, you know, airfields and uh, communication systems. So because you have not had U.S. cruise missile systems ubiquitously moving in and out, there's a reasonable expectation that there'll be some challenges to operate there. And you don't want to find those challenges out during a crisis. You want to fight them out during an exercise. So from my point of view, I would hit these. Uh, these are things that would be certainly be on my defended asset list if I were uh, if I were the Air Defense Commander. The, the, those if I was the uh, SACIR or US UCOM Commander, because those are the system. Those you know those storage units and the airfields are critical to the first 72 hours of combat with, with the Russians. And I'm going to stipulate, attach myself to everything Tom said about Russia. I mean, there's a there's a lot going wrong for them in combined maneuver warfare, but they are they're firing cruise missiles and ballistic missiles like a drunken sailor. And they may only be hitting at 60%, but that's kind of what we expected from the Russians, right? You know, they don't have 90 to 95% precision like the US Air Force and US Navy have demonstrated with these precision strike uh, weapons. Um, so that they, they are having a lot of collateral damage, but they're also impacting a lot of intended damage. And we can expect to see the same thing. So I really think Tom and, and, and the team uh, really hit on things. So let me go to the uh, to the one. I think there's two good questions here. Um, the uh, the the first. I think this is for Tom. I mean, how do you feel about the ability of NATO members to talk with one another? In other words, plug and play. And uh, will this exercise kind of help you know close that gap in your mind? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question, and and that's the intent. Um, is if you're really going to do integration, uh, and you, all you're doing is hypothetical, that doesn't work. And I and I've talked to the Marcom commander as well about doing that with, uh, you know, either something that is in Operation Sea Guardian or something uh, that is part of the uh, standing uh, naval maritime group, or just as a vigilance activity with the U.S. is doing anyway. And um, doing that part because he's in, he's keen and intent, uh, Admiral Blunt, on the plug and play. Um, I think we can do it with limited partners. Uh, I feel confident with a limited subset of those that we're pretty good, just like we do on anti-submarine warfare with a select subgroup of NATO. Um, but it's not NATO wide yet, and um, perhaps as Ricky implied. The NASAMs going to Ukraine can be a little bit of a wake-up call, and uh, so ACCS isn't doing what it was supposed to do. That's widely acknowledged here uh, across the board. Um, so if we make one of our lines of effort to make that stuff really work, then I, I think we can get there. Um, but this exercise, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. Start small, but make sure they can integrate and then not just make sure they can integrate and turn it on and go, yeah, it works, but actually run it and run targets by it and see whether it does what it's supposed to do. Thanks. That's a great, a great response. And, and the, one thing I'd said on there is that 
Um, you know, we just saw in the paper the other day that the Marine Corps MacGyvered together a system with um, with a uh, the Gator radar, which is U.S. a, a, a U.S. C2 system, their common aviation command and control system, and then pulled in the Tamir missile and its launcher from Iron Dome. And I wouldn't misread the article too much. It's not Iron Dome, which to me implies the command and control system, but it's a U.S. command and control system, which means its integratability is much higher. There's still some work to do with the Tamir missile and its integratability, but as we MacGyver together systems. We've got to be testing them. And, and I'm going to assume for a minute that the U.S. Army is only going to get there with the MacGyver because the normal acquisition process is not delivered over the last little bit. But, uh, Ricky, did you have something? Yeah, I have something. Um, the um, ability, we're not, we're not talking about the ability to defend maneuvering force, artillery maneuvering force as a critical factor. I mean, Russia, like you said, does not have their combined capabilities to be able to strike those. But that's coming, and and that to me is extremely important, and, and and could lead a little bit with the command and control on that. Or, or I mean, it doesn't look like we're taking this at a high level, political level, because nobody wants to defend that type of stuff. They want to defend the cities and the ammo dumps. Where are we with that, and reducing the cost of that? David, you, you, want to that? you want to go ahead. Yeah, let let uh, let's see if uh, David wants to take a whack at that. Yeah. So if I understood your question right, Ricky, wh where are we at with defending maneuver forces? Is that accurate? That's correct. Army yeah. maneuver forces. Yeah. Right. So uh, uh, so we're behind. Uh, simply put, um, you know, the capabilities ongoing. It, it's it's very similar to uh, uh, the talk of uh, building Patriot Battalion in sixteen and seventeen. Right. It's going to take time. So. It's no different with uh, on onboarding and activating these these maneuver shore ad battalions to do exactly what you just described. Uh, and if you rewind the uh, the clock, you know, 20, 30 years, that's exactly what we did uh, as a divisional asset. You had an organic uh, maneuver shore ad battalion, for lack of better terms, a shore ad battalion that was organic to every Army division. And, and they supported, based on the division commander's priorities, uh, where to project that capability, whether it was with whether with maneuver brigade combat teams, whether it was providing uh, defensive fires to a uh, aviation uh, forward arming and, uh, and and refueling point or what have you. Um, but again, to answer your question, we're, we're behind. Uh, what, what's projected right now? Three more uh, inshore uh, battalions, but we're still, uh, I say we collectively, the Army is still working to uh, round out the first I'm sure I've Italian there in Europe. So I, I'll pick up on it though and say first I think you're you know probably not to cause you a nightmare David but it starts with Sergeant York was the collapse of this capability but uh but I will say this the army's funding it this year 500 million dollars last year 500 million dollars to, to M sure ad I contrast that with IFPIC which has gotten 19 million dollars which is to say that's the amount of money you give a program when it's like you know when it's at the funeral home uh, you know, uh, it is not, you know, it's 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 hot standby money just so no one gets laid off in the program office. It isn't actually procurement or R&D money. So I'm worried. I think they're investing in MSHA, Red Ricky. It's a ways to go, but uh, it really is that fixed site defense that, you know, where the Air, the Air Force reasonably expected the Army to provide it. And I don't think there's a unit and there to the system. Mark, to can I just ask Tom? Do they have a lead systems architect for NATO for missile defense? Is there an architecture being laid like we're doing in Guam, like we're doing the U.S. Homeland that Congress is asking for? Do we have a lead si system architect for the integrated missile defense of NATO? Yeah, Mark smiling. Um, it, if there is one, I don't know who it is. That that doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but. Um, as I'm building our checklist, uh, which I'm going to need the help of folks like you, um, you know, overall is uh, we need a system. Uh, point one is, do we have a lead architect? And do we have a lead cat herder? Um, I don't know that. Uh, and, you know, the other fun part about NATO headquarters is we do everything by committee. Um, so getting 30 people to agree on anything is one of the reasons there's a problem. So th that's something to look into. That is how they fixed AGS uh, as much as they have uh, as a NATO-owned element was they 
you know, they, they pick one lead sled dog. And that's not easy because not everybody agrees. And, and it was easier because AGS is actually a uh, MOU program, right? So you don't have to get all 30. You have to get whoever's signing up to this. And if you do it early enough in the process, then the other 30, uh, you know, the other 29 have to, you know, if you want to join, you sign up to this is the lead sled dog. So um, it's different when you try and do something, especially common funded. Um, because then everybody wants their piece of the pie. That's how you ended up with a dual U.S. and French. Um, that was the price, was you needed multiple companies to do that as part of it. Now, I wasn't here for that, so there's probably a lot more nuance to that than, than I'm giving you. Um, that's sort of the uh, the fighter pilot bar napkin answer rather than a, a detailed one. Mark, probably yeah, let me, uh, let me jump out done. a few thoughts on that. First, I was laughing because... When Ricky says there was a missile defense architect for Guam, I would say there were two, and they managed to screw it up by having two people do one person's job. Um, yeah, and which is to say, in our country, MDA should be the system architect, and uh, and CAPE should be the evaluator, not a secondary architect that screws the system up. Um, but to get very specifically at it, and, and because Jason had to drop off, I'll pick up and say, U.S. European Command has a has an uh, a, a always has a secondary set of responsibilities. They support NATO, but then they build the coalition of the willing. And I think under that, the USAFE commander should be building an architecture that's plug and play, Ricky, to get at your answer. Then to get to you, NATO can look at that and probably do a better assessment of, okay, what do we need to build on that? Now, look, that usually works well when the U.S. is the preponderance, 28% or more of the effort. But when, and so in the Patriot and THAAD, you know, in missile defense, I think in Aegis Ashore, People look at us that way, but in that purely cruise missile defense, it becomes very hard because the United States is not a preponderance of effort now. And, and so we don't, you say he struggles to build that plug and play when there's no, for the coalition of the willing, because there's no U.S. to set as the base. And so I think in the absence of that, we just, it's probably going to take that special moment when NATO, when you say the you safety using its NATO hat and its U.S. UCOM hat, you know, kind of has to close that gap. We do it in mind warfare would be another area where we do that because the U.S. just isn't willing to push mind warfare assets over here permanently. And it takes them about a month and a half to sail here, maybe two, uh, if they get here and, and usually on the back of another ship. My point on this is this is one of those unique opportunities where the U.S. has a hole in its swing and we really need to close that gap. And I think it, it, it sits in the USAFE slant NATO Air Defense Commander's role. Can I, can I hear John Lips on this? Because he's in a pretty good position on architecture of what they've been doing with MDA and formidable shield with with some pretty advanced capabilities bringing countries together. John? Yeah, Ricky, thank you. And and I think to, to Admiral Montgomery's point, um, <clears throat> UCOM has been leaning pretty far forward in trying to uh, instill that initiative. You know, as someone had previously mentioned, you know, even though we talked about integrated air and missile defense, this topic within NATO is still remains challenged because when you look at the conversation of ballistic missile defense, you really are constraining both the threat um, and then also relying on the voluntary national contributions of the alliance members to support that. Now, you know, Somewhat, uh, you know, the developments on the Eastern Front have, have uh, accelerated, I think, um, many of the alliance and the components of response to this threat. Uh, and we've seen that, you know, in real world activity, you know, I won't go into any details, but I'll certainly um, can share that, you know, there have been some very robust conversations um, that have, I think, resulted in positive movement with regards to how the Alliance and the components look at uh, the Cal and the Dow, um, quite frankly, in theater. Um, and so it's a reflection of uh, what's occurring, uh, and that's goodness. You know, I, there's another aspect of this that, that also, as we look at, um, you know, the world is learning. And when we spoke about, you know, precise, precision guided munitions earlier, uh, one of the, the challenges that I think the, the integrated air and missile defense community is going to continue to have moving forward is the application uh, and employment of these weapon systems uh, from the adversary's wheelhouse and how he's learning on how to employ these capabilities 
across domains and what that causes as we look through the command and control lens of is it a strategic fight or is it a tactical fight? Well, but John, 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 wasn't MDA the lead architecture for EPAA? Who was the lead architecture for EPAA? Somebody was the lead architecture for that. But but it's it's only missile defense, Ricky. I'll jump in. You know, you you we can't take that. You know, I there is good architecture there, but it's about missile defense, and it was about our Iran, right? I mean, we got to be very careful here. We're trying to make lips yeah. repurpose something into a mission that it wasn't designed for and a threat it actually wasn't specified for. John, I didn't mean to step on you there, but just giving you a, a little bit of ship made assist. No, no, sir, you're, you're exactly right. And, and I, you know, I appreciate the weather eye there because that is, is exactly right, Ricky. And, and the other thing that we need to, to, I think, recognize is that, you know, there, there are acquisition architectures and then there are policy um, architectures. And so, you know, as Admiral Montgomery pointed, I mean, the, the, the genesis behind Aegis Ashore will You know, and so there's, if, if you if you look back in that, there's how we apply those things and, and those tools and what we use them for. Uh, we need to understand their their um, origins. Looking, you know, looking kind of into the the, the future quickly. Um, I won't stump Formidable Shield 23, but one more time, um, you know, to to um, the the previous uh, comments about the integration across the theater. One, I, I ask everyone to take a look back at the map to consider the maritime domain in the Yukon theater and the size of that, quite frankly, is enormous. Um, and recognize that for Formidable Shield in this next iteration, we are exercising simultaneously in two different JFC's battle space, Brunsum and Norfolk, in the generation of the effects uh, and the conditions that those commanders desire across all components, integrating that land, air, sea, and space um, aspect. Um, so it's going to be a, a, a big, um, big evolution, and it's executing concurrently with USAFE's Astral Night. So we are intentionally teeing up resource decisions that the four-star commanders will have to make in the conduct or the, the safe and successful conduction of a live fire mission rehearsal in theater. So that, you know, to your, your, your earlier question, it's happening, shipmate, we, it, we're doing it. Hey, hey, John, that's great. That counts as your final stump. Uh, let me get Ricky with the time we're past. I, I wanna give Dave and Tom another minute just to close out. So uh, Dave Shank, any, any final thoughts before we pass it back to Ricky? Uh, yeah, I just I, I would comment on something uh, Tom alluded. Well, two comments on something Tom alluded to. One is the policy challenges just across the board. Uh, you know, we mentioned thir thir 30 nations as part of that make up NATO. But, uh, you know, I experienced it uh, when I was serving and some of the challenges. Uh, you know, there's an old saying, never, never, never waste a good crisis. Right. So uh, what an opportunity right now to uh, to work through some of these uh, policies of of uh, country A. Uh, talking to country B and doing it in a timely manner and sharing that information. Um, the, the, the other piece to that is the uh, cross-domain solution uh, and the, really the security classification. And not to get too, uh, uh, too security controlled on you here, but uh, you know, there are some nations that consider uh, information secret while others can consider that information unclassified. And so how do you get beyond that? You know, and you do it through uh, some type of cross cross domain solution device. So uh, um, we're familiar with several uh, devices that are out there, but uh, just wanted to bring that. Uh, Ricky, thanks again for for letting me uh, participate again with uh, with the cast of all stars here. It's uh, been a pleasure. Hey, thanks, Tom. Over to you. Sorry, button hell. Um, yeah, uh, thanks. I, I really appreciate doing this. It makes me feel good knowing that somebody else is worrying like I am about this problem set. Um, amongst us here, uh, I got to tell you that, uh, you know, I started out in classic fighter pilot style trying to say the emperor has no clothes. And then I was corrected um, that uh, the emperor has some clothes. And then that's what they wanted me to say. Um, and I've kind of settled somewhere in the mode of um, the emperor doesn't have enough clothes. Uh, and so 
it, it really feels, you know, compared to where you guys want to go, it, it feels uh, slow and sideways. And um, we're going to keep pushing from this end if you keep pushing from your end. And I got to, to talk to General Cavoli real quick. Um, and IAMD was on the front of the plate. Like, this is something you need to get after, and this is something you know and that you can get after. And I think he's going to be a good uh, uh, landing point for getting this done. He and, and uh, now General Williams out at uh, um, Usurer. And it, it, we got Scorch coming in new as well. So I think we're, we're going we're gonna to try and move the ball. Uh, thanks again for doing this. Hey, thank you, Tom, and I uh, appreciate that. And uh, I think the Emperor is like wearing a pair of socks. Potentially and nothing else. Like a board, it's like a porn star movie. All right. Hey, the, uh, and uh, I think you're right. You can go all the way back to Ben Hodges to say that user your has been an honest describer of the challenge. Hey, Ricky, you got the last minute here. I would say, Tom, the emperor has clothes in the closet, maybe in the sock drawer, but he hasn't got them on. And we got to get them on. And there are capabilities today that's in Europe right now that need, even if you can just put it on your on your feet. To be delivered in Ukraine is the it's the it's the moment. It's it's where you're going to turn. It's where you're forcing capabilities, and you've got to continue to bring them awareness. People are dying every day because of non having not the missile defense capabilities we talked about today. And command and control, I think, is critical on big decisions at the highest levels to get that right, to filter it down, and to move current capability. Mark was right. There are Countries that got NASAM capability, the only thing in the world right now that does cruise missile defense 360. Why isn't that being integrated into all our systems and getting this thing forward while we wait for IFPIC, while we wait for IBCS, while we wait for LTAMs and all the other stuff coming? They're great, but right now we don't have anything. They're, the clothes are in the closet, man. <laughs> get them out of the closet and get them on our emperor. It was a great discussion. Thank each one of you for, for coming. And, and participating in a real discussion. This is a real discussion at the right time for the right reasons to win. So thank you. Mark, 